it's a book that we think it's important because it's really try, an attempt to try to understand this landscape of thought that is opening. When you think about what posthumanism is, well, it's the technological oriented variation that leads to transhumanism, or it's the ecological oriented version that leads to a decentering of the humans. Both are really big thoughts uh, that, that uh, separates uh, with a lot of, 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 of common held ideas from uh, the, the particular the Western tradition of, of thinking. And it's important because it's about moral, it's about responsibility, it's about an ability to react to things that are going on in the world right now. We have chapters on, on the more traditional arts like um, literature, Uh, and, and music, um, and also moving into uh, that part of avant-garde art, which is constituted by bio-art. And then uh, we cover different sorts of more popular art forms, uh, film and television, uh, comic strips um, in a digital fashion, um, anime films and, and games. Um, and, um, and with these, um, we will also um, show that um, Post-human imagination has actually become part of the popular imagination in, in, in the last decades. And this raises lots of issues, and I don't think these issues are going to disappear. So even though this volume is called The Handbook of Posthumanism, and let and make mo no mistake, this is the most sophisticated reference work on either and both transhumanism and posthumanism that's available. And, and if you just look at stuff that was being published that were passing themselves off as uh, reference books in this area, let's say 10 years ago, you, you could definitely see a step change here, okay? Things are much more sophisticated, much more articulated. I mean, here what you have is, as it were, uh, if I may say so, something that actually looks like an alternative worldview to humanism right, in a sort of full comprehensive sense with, with just as much complexity as one would have expected from humanism. So I think the 18th century and the Enlightenment is someone who shot, is, is a, a context that should not be um, brushed aside too easily. I'm not making a case for the Enlightenment because uh, I would be nostalgic for it in any way. Um, I know full well that in order to lead the kind of life that I lead now, I would have to be a French aristocrat like Émilie de Châtelet. And she died in her early 40s in childbirth. Um, the uh, intellectual um, contexts are profoundly different. But I think it's exactly that different that makes it exciting to look at uh, similarities and how they play out in these different um, thought worlds of the Enlightenment and post-humanism. Because when you look at a list of features of subjectivity that is relevant for post-humanism, entanglements between the self and environment, entanglements between animal and human experience, and subjectivity in a mediated and technological age, um, the links are relatively close. Uh, and I haven't even talked about the Industrial Revolution and the Media Revolution, where printed matter um, started to circulate ever more rapidly, ever more um, in ever more increased volume uh, throughout the 18th century. This is an age where the understanding of self and environment, the understanding of human experience in relation to other kinds of experience and technology were really at the center of discussion. So I have tried to think humanism and post-humanism very much in the context of justice um, over the last 10 years, environmental justice in particular. And I've, um, since environmental justice tends to focus um, on the conflicts between different groups of humans in their access to nature and their risks from, um, uh, from uh, natural catastrophes and contamination, I've tried to twist that a little bit by focusing on the question of multi-species justice. That is, how do we, how do we calibrate issues of justice against the background of vastly differing understandings of what justice constitutes in the context of our interactions with nature? But how do we also think about the claims on our moral consideration of different groups of humans with very different degrees of privilege and different groups of non-humans? That is, the plants and animals and the microorganisms that co-inhabit the planet with us. 
and who are often left um, at the threshold when it comes to talking about justice. So multi-species justice is sort of a way of thinking post-humanistically within a context of justice. We are made of what we are not and are continually constructing ourselves out of the other, defining the other in terms of what it is we are always already optimizing for. Every time we say this is human or the human is this, we are inevitably injecting the outside, that is the non-human, the post-human, into our definition of the human, suggesting that any attempt at definition is futile. Then I should maybe just uh, mention that uh, we are uh, proud of, of, of the cover uh, by Pierre Wick, um, which um, we think is, is um, exactly um, being indeterminate in, in, in what it uh, depicts uh, in relation to uh, the body and, and, um, um, and, and the environment. I mean, it, I think this, this, this picture is... Uh, wonderfully indeterminate in, in, in dealing with um, the post-human and doesn't also fall into this trap which sometimes uh, ha haunts uh, the post-human feel which is uh, um, depicting um, cyborgian bodies in a maybe too uh, technologically explicit manner. I, I think this is, uh, this is um, indeterminate in, in a really interesting way. And to pick up on uh, Alexander's viewpoint, and uh, also one of the speeches this afternoon, uh, with the title, Who's Afraid of the Post-Human? Uh, I think there's a lot of fear of the post-human. I think part of the reason why the Anthropocene is, uh, is, is popular, uh, which is, is, is a, perhaps a wrong way of phrasing it, but it does have that property that it does not uh, suggest that we are not the last advanced species on the Earth that there might be some, someone after us that are more advanced. And that's, again, one of the big thoughts of posthumanism, which uh, the arts, uh, be it uh, visual arts, uh, film, literature, and so on, are not afraid of tackling. Actually, find is thrilling in, in so many ways, but which is something that we are much more reluctant to think of, but which is, I think, at the current uh, situation and with the way that technology is, is developing, something that we really have to con consider. And, and think about uh, some of the uh, visionaries uh, in the arts, for example, Stanley Kubrick in his uh, movie, uh, uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey, uh, where you really have all the post-human and evolutionary themes uh, in there uh, prior to the technologies that we today laugh off as being sort of uh, primitive and way outdated, uh, but essentially striking all the same notes that we are trying to investigate today. 